Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Smith, and I want to talk to you today about cybersecurity, keeping it simple. This is a presentation I've put together uh, to help people in healthcare to better understand cybersecurity and to provide examples that you can share with your family, friends, and coworkers. So uh, you may find some of the illustrations to be a little amateurish, and my apologies in advance. Um, since I really want you to focus on the content and not my poor effort at graphic uh, design. So today I'm going to cover the basics of cybersecurity, discuss threats versus vulnerabilities so you can understand some of the terminology, a review of what phishing is and um, how it impacts us and practical steps at home and business that we can take and teach to those we love and to our employees and coworkers. And I always like to put the disclaimer to remember that every phishing email that I give as an example is an attack on the integrity of the fine companies whose logos are used and they are victims as much as we are uh, as the cyber thieves uh, tarnish their brands and cost us all uh, money and th threaten our ability to share information and to maintain privacy and security. So um, I use these examples as true examples that have come across and uh, please see them for what they are, um, but recognize these companies as, as victims as well. A little bit about me, um, I am a family physician and informatician. I've been in healthcare for 40 years. I have served for the last two years on the Cybersecurity and Information Sharing Act Task Force of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we published our guidelines for healthcare uh, cybersecurity practices the first week of January in 2019. Uh, for myself, I was a very early adopter of electronic health records back in the early 90s and have since integrated and automated over 60 hospitals and have assessed uh, probably a total of 100 hospitals, um, automating about 1% of the U.S. healthcare hospitals and um, written two books, uh, which are listed here. Uh, currently, I work as a consultant and have spent 12 years as a chief medical information officer for two health systems. Uh, and also am a mentor and um, uh, actually a copywriter as well. So let's uh, dive into cybersecurity. Um, first off, I have to say that cybersecurity is becoming more and more of a problem in the United States as we have more and more information online and hardly a day goes by that we don't see that there's been a major uh, data breach, ransomware attacks, and our privacy and uh, digital information has been at risk. It's not just limited to the United States, it's a worldwide problem, but the United States seems to be the most lucrative market uh, for both individuals and nation states uh, to go after us. And if we understand basic cybersecurity practices, we can make ourselves and our loved ones safer. So we should all care about this. And, you know, it's pretty interesting that there are over 4,000 phishing attacks daily in the United States. And this represents the most common threat that we have. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about phishing. It may be repetitive to some of you. But I want to give you some real live examples that have come across my email in the last uh, year so that you can begin to recognize what is phishing, what is not phishing, and also to compliment companies on how they help to uh, prevent phishing attacks. So recognize the cybersecurity attacks are not only an attack on the privacy security and at cost to us, but they also tarnish the reputation of physicians, hospitals, uh, businesses, and individuals uh, who are victims of violations of 
uh, personal health data, personal uh, consumer information, and privacy data throughout. So it's an economic impact and a reputation impact that um, affects all of us. But as I always like to tell healthcare leaders, um, when an attack happens, it's usually the person at the top that is in the news releases. And I rarely see an IT vendor's name on the front page. So just because you hire people to manage your cybersecurity practices, recognize that it's really at the top that uh, cyber security attacks make the front page. So it's important that every uh, company, whether large or small, recognize that they're at risk for cybersecurity instances. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about the terminology, and I'm not a cybersecurity expert. Um, so for those of you that are, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible for lay people. But I like to look at threats vulnerabilities, assets, and what we do about them. So the threats are the first thing that I want to talk about, and they really represent uh, things that put us at risk. So these are the tax ends. So these are hackers. These are phishing emails. These are anything that come into our um, world or our life that can potentially expose our data um, to violation or, or uh, theft. Vulnerabilities, on the other hand, are the problems that we create ourselves that allow our data to be at risk more than it need to be. So this is the Swiss cheese of our networks. So a vulnerability um, might be lack of a firewall. It could be uh, not having our uh, software patched to the latest version. It could be uh, out-of-date equipment, uh, or it could even be employees that don't know good cybersecurity practices. So all of these are vulnerabilities that put us at risk. Next come our assets, and our assets are the things, both physical and electronic, that may be connected to a network. So think about our employees are an asset, and they are certainly connected to a wide variety of devices from credit card terminals to smartphones to laptops and desktops and scanners and printers. And all of these things potentially carry uh, personal health information, uh, personal consumer or protected consumer uh, information, protected health information, business strategic information, and personal information such as emails, passwords, and other such information. And our assets are uh, threatened by theft as well as external attacks through hacking events and are made at higher risk due to the vulnerabilities that we allow in our system. So it behooves us to do some type of assessment at risk understand what is in our inventory of assets, what are our current vulnerabilities, and what are our threats. Next, we should be thinking about uh, what is our cybersecurity management plan. So once we've identified what we're at risk, um, then what are we going to do about it? How are we going to respond to threats? How are we going to minimize vulnerabilities? Are we going to have a patching plan? Um, are we going to have cybersecurity insurance? Are we going to have cybersecurity monitoring of our networks? Uh, it all depends on how much budget you can put to it, what makes practical sense, and then how are we going to protect our assets to both physical loss uh, and to um, external attacks. Finally, cybersecurity management would include what is our response in the case of an event. So uh, how are we responding to the latest ransomware attack in the news? What do we do next if we accidentally leave a laptop at a TSA checkpoint at a local airport or we lose our smartphone? Uh, how do we get rid of a computer printer that may have images on a hard drive and we need to discard that printer because it no longer works, how do we ensure that we're not 
uh, creating a vulnerability because images of protected health information or protected consumer information might be on that hard drive. Likewise for computers and desktops and old cell phones. And then finally, what do we need to do to be compliant with the various uh, organizations we belong with or the insurance policies that we have? And what are the best practices for our industry? Um, whether it's uh, credit card management best practices or in healthcare, we worry about HIPAA, which is a health um, insurance portability and patient protection act. So there's all kinds of things that we have to um, know about and have a plan about. So let's talk a little bit about phishing. And I'd like to explain that phishing is a threat that exploits our vulnerabilities. So this was an email I got uh, that said um, I had an Apple order and notify me of a current transaction. And as I highlight here, at first glance, oh no, uh, something's been ordered on Apple that I know I didn't order. It's been charged to my credit card. And this does what a phishing attack is intended to do. It's intended to give you an emotional response. And notice that they do things like send it to support at apple.com to show some legitimacy to it, even though this is obviously not an email from Apple. And I'll show you how to digest this. And before you click on it and open up that attachment, um, how you analyze this in your inbox. So notice that what they really want you to do is to click here and open this attachment, which probably is loaded with some type of Trojan horse or viral uh, implant that's going to either freeze up your computer, steal data, or implant a Trojan, which is going to become active at some later. So we'll digest that in a moment, but recognize that phishing is spelled with a PH, it is, uh, but it is really about hooking you on the line. Uh, they're becoming more and more sophisticated. They tend to look authentic. Um, they have a sense of urgency and they hope to elicit a knee-jerk response from you. So I would say a successful phishing uh, email would be one that elicits an immediate call of action. They want you to open an attachment, click on a link, either one of which could download malicious code leading to a ransomware attack or placing some uh, software packet in the form of a virus or a Trojan uh, to cause problems either now or in the future. Or they want you to respond to an email and supply what they need. So these are the bank account ones where they want you to secure, uh, uh, authenticate or verify your account and or they're telling you the IRS is getting ready to send you to jail and all you need to do is call and validate who you are and they get your bank account number, your social security number and anything else they need uh, to become you in the uh, dark web. So here you are just another day at home or in the office, you've got your firewall up, you're sitting here at your computer. Uh, boy, this email really looks important and zap, they got you with a uh, phishing attack. They send uh, the malware or virus or a Trojan onto your computer, and now they've got your hard drive, they steal your data, they corrupt it, they hold you ransom, or they mimic you um, and uh, uh, do some other malicious activity. So your best defense is really awareness, and awareness should be yourself, your family, and your staff. I have an 89-year-old father, and I've educated him, and he today uh, just laughs about uh, what they throw at him because he knows uh, the rules of how to look at these, and he knows uh, what to do and what not to do. So we need to educate people, assess, and if you're really sophisticated and have a lot of money to invest, you can actually uh, purchase monitoring equipment. Um, but for the most individuals, I, I want you to be aware and to educate yourself and your loved ones to do this. 
and uh, your email provider can block it. And anytime you get a phishing attack, I like to immediately right click on it and block it for future so I don't have to look at it again. And I block either that uh, specific email account or sometimes I will block the whole domain. So let's go back uh, to our original email and let's dissect it a little more and I'll show you some additional examples. So here's our Apple order phishing attack. Uh, I circled the things that I had circled on the slide. Now notice that the word purchase is misspelled. Misspellings are very, very common, especially when they're coming from overseas. Uh, so look for these. Notice that they try to confuse you by uh, making you think this is an email from apple.com. But notice that I've got my font set up so that my ones appear different than my L's. And so be careful with what default font you use in your email, uh, because if your ones look like L's, uh, that would definitely look like apple.com. But if you take the time to set your fonts up appropriately, you won't fall for this. Notice that statement is also uh, misspelled. Again, the word purchase in the grammar's badge or Apple has been purchase on Apple Store. Another good clue that this isn't legitimate. Um, so all I can say is uh, there's plenty of clues on why you don't want to open this attachment and avoid this. And as they used to say on the old TV show, Lost in Space, Danger Will Robinson. So remember that and, and look for these clues before you knee jerk and react to it. So this is the next example I want to show you. Uh, this looks like it comes from Bank of America. And notice that uh, it says Bank of America Online Banking at ealerts.bankofamerica.com. Uh, security alert, your online banking password was reset. It had my bank account in here. And notice it does not have anything to click on to reset my password. It's purely a notification. So this is an example of a company doing excellent um, preventive maintenance and not setting you up for failure. Uh, it's an information email, not an action email. And this is what banks and vendors and what you should do if you own your own company. Uh, don't send emails uh, asking people to click on things. Um, unless you've established a relationship and they're expecting it. It uh, really adds for a lot of, of help on getting them um, to not fall into a trap. I will say a caution, however, that I get in the habit of not calling emails unless I already, or uh, not calling phone numbers on emails. I always like to take a moment and validate that phone number before I uh, call it. But in this case, I had reset my password. So this is a legitimate email and also showing a best practice that Bank of America is, is doing. So next quiz. Okay, this is an email that looks like it's from Capital One. It says verify your email. Now notice on this one, there's a link that is asking you to verify it. And a nice little thank you for choosing Capital One. So what do you think? Well, if I look at the email, it says Capital One at security dot. And it doesn't spell Capital One. And notice it comes from this email domain, elementb.com. Uh, this is a fr frequent domain that I get phishing email attacks from, so I have blocked that. But I'm going to show you some examples. And uh, so put that as one that you don't want to get through. But I want to show you how on phishing attacks, they often put the company name in the before the at sign. And that, again, is intended to confuse you. Uh, because your mind is seeing that capital one and you think it's legit. But more importantly, anytime you see a link that is in a banking email that tells you to go there, 
Uh, most banks won't do this to you. They won't have you sign in from an email or verify an email. Um, just skip those steps. And if you get an email from a banking um, provider, uh, just acknowledge what they're doing in your head and go log in through your normal internet portal and uh, look and see if there's any messages or phone your banker and have them help you. Don't fall into that trap. So this was a pretty good fake, but if, if you know what I'm teaching you here to never click on these verify emails or sign in, um, it, it's a common thing they use and Capital One would never do this to you. Okay, now if you're, you're hopeful that your email provider is helping you, and again, this is an email from Element One, and remember I had set up that they were a domain that is worrisome, and so once I do that, I've got a message now that comes in that uh, puts this as a phishing message, so I've got this warning. So I know, and again, look at American Express up front uh, as the name. It's a clue that's a phishing email because American Express doesn't need to repeat their company name in this uh, email. So just recognize that as something that um, is a warning sign anytime you see that. Again, notice that this is exactly the same format as the email on the Capital One. Uh, again, they have Verify in the same place. Um, I didn't open it, so there was a, would have been American Express email there. So notice that elementb.com is an organization that's allowing just hitting every bank out there. So they probably hit every bank in the United States, and they just repeatedly send you all these emails. And, you know, you obviously don't respond to ones that you don't have an account into, but don't respond to any of these because they are problematic. Okay, is this legit or is this phishing? So let's look at it, take a moment. Okay, so this one I would say is maybe phishing, maybe not. Uh, they definitely end the domain with apple.com, but I would say this is most likely a phishing attack. Um, I would not expect Apple to set me up with something like this and notice that Apple is in before the at sign, uh, which is a key to why I would never uh, do uh, sign into this. Also, uh, but they do know my email. Uh, so that makes me lean a little bit towards legit, but I would never, ever, ever click on this email. So I personally suspect this is phishing, but the apple.com makes me think that perhaps uh, this did come from some provider of, of Apple, but I would personally never click on anything like this and I did log on to my Apple site and there was no issues. Um, so I suspect this was probably phishing, but uh, this is why if you know your rules ahead of time, if somebody sends me an email with their business name in the, in the na uh, before the at sign, I'm probably going to assume it's phishing and uh, figure out a different way to contact that company and know what to do. Okay, so legitimate or phishing? Again, this has the knee jerk thing of, oh no, someone's added a new email to my account. And uh, that just, you know, makes you angry and makes you wanna do something. But as you can see, this is some nonsense uh, domain again. And anytime you see these long domains, um, you know, you realize that um, just avoid them, even if they were legit, um, which they're probably not. Um, I just don't uh, do, would do business with anyone that would send me such nonsense.
Okay, here's what I called the worst fishing attack of the year. Um, this had a big logo oversized saying it was from Amazon. And as you can see, it is total nonsense. It looks uh, worse than a ransom note that was clipped out of a news, uh, series of newspaper headlines. It has, um, I, I have no idea what the purpose of this was, uh, but um, obviously I got it. And uh, I don't know if it was a joke, but um, obviously um, this violates every rule. And um, I hope that I can one day publicly embarrass whoever wrote this nonsense. But uh, I feel bad for Amazon to have to put up with junk like this that uh, gets put out there. Uh, ransomware. Uh, so ransomware is where they literally uh, put, uh, take control of your hardware and uh, lock down your hard drive, put a secret key on it, and then they send you an email saying uh, you need to pay a ransom if you ever want to see your data again. So the only um, solution to this is to always have a backup of your data and go ahead and not pay the ransomware um, reformat your hard drive and just start over and figure out what you did wrong to get the ransomware in the fir first place. Uh, there's a healthcare specifically has had, um, and the United States has had uh, a lot of these um, ransomware attacks that have been large scale, some in Europe and spread to the United States, but want to cry, not Petra and Bad Rabbit are examples of it. And um, the important thing to know about ransomware, when it first started, uh, they were really going after big players and they would often charge $10,000 or more. Um, and if you took a company, especially a hospital, and uh, asked them to pay 10,000 versus lock up all their financial and patient records uh, or remove them, um, that would be a, a big interruption of business. And so um, early on, some people paid it rather than uh, um, be held hostage to it. But people have gotten smarter and know that they just don't pay it. They have their data backed up and they literally uh, restore it and don't do it. So the ransomware attackers have figured out that it's uh, better to go after a lot of little users and charge lower fees uh, because I can, where someone may have a strategy that's worth avoiding a $10,000 ransomware payment, uh, they might find a $500 ransomware payment uh, cheaper to pay than the time and effort to restore their data otherwise. So um, they normally request that you pay in some type of cybersecurity in an untraceable way. And quite frankly, if you feed these people any dollars at all, you're just encouraging to do more of it. And there's no guarantee that you're going to get your data back anyway. So uh, the best thing to do about ransomware is to avoid phishing, falling uh, prey to phishing attacks, which may set you up for ransomware attacks and to always have a backup of your data so that you can restore it in case that you are attacked. So, you should know what vulnerabilities you have. Um, unprotected, insecure networks. Um, I often go to hotels now and they have unprotected networks. Uh, just don't go on them. It's uh, better to avoid being on the internet and to use your own personal hotspot. Most people have smartphones now that allow you to surf the web and even create a hotspot that you can use on your computer. Yes, it may cost you a little more a month, but um, it's probably better than going on an unsecured uh, network. You know a network is secured if when you're logged on to it, it has uh, first off a password to get on it, and then there's a little uh, padlock icon that shows it's a secure uh, network. And notice that at many hotels, you still have to put your room number in and, and your last name but it still may be an unsecured network. So 
look for those logos. And if it's unsecured, it's probably better to avoid uh, being on that network than to risk uh, getting your device um, violated. Physical asset loss, uh, obviously be careful when you go through airport checkpoints. Don't leave devices in your car in plain sight to encourage people to break into it. Carry devices with you rather than uh, leave them behind. Um, and uh, make sure your personnel are trained and your families and friends are trained. And I always tell people, if you have work computers at home, uh, don't uh, be downloading uh, external uh, games and things and having other people working on your business devices uh, because they may accidentally download something uh, that could threaten your other data. Make sure you have a backup of your data and your backup should be on-site as well as off-site. Um, recognize the fact that uh, having a, uh, you may go away on vacation and you have a nice, good, large uh, three terabyte drive sitting on your desk with your data backed up. But if your house gets robbed or your house burns down, you still could lose your data. So uh, it's best to have uh, more than one uh, data backup in case of a ransomware attack or a physical loss of your data. And uh, you should have some type of business IT continuity plan, uh, both on uh, responding to any type of violation of privacy or security of your information or data, as well as what to do in case of a ransom attack, um, and also how you keeping your uh, employees and people that access your devices up to date. Um, obviously, your personnel I've already talked about. Um, you can use this presentation and play it so that people can understand some basic cyber hygiene um, or create some knowledge of your own. Print this out and uh, use it as handouts. Um, I encourage you to get background checks if you're hiring employees. Uh, password policies are really important. If you have a device that everyone is using the same password. Uh, that always puts your uh, devices at risk uh, since employees can come and go and people visit your house. Uh, so never post a um, password on your device um, and make sure that they get changed at some frequency um, in case they do get violated. Uh, train people. Um, you can, there's a variety of companies that will do simulated phishing attacks and send a friendly phishing attack so you can test which of your employees will actually fall for it. And then you can do extra training and education and remediation for people that fall for the phishing attacks. And remember, you should send really obvious ones and some not so obvious ones. Um, give, give them some challenges as I have given you. And obviously, we talked about physical asset control. Uh, make sure that uh, people are aware of where their devices are and make sure that if you issue devices uh, to employees that they are password protected and encrypted so that their loss are stolen. People just don't have immediate access to any of the data or information on those devices. Uh, for your cybersecurity pra uh, practices, I discussed uh, having patches on your software, knowing that you have antiviral software as well as, as, well as anti-ransomware, have partition areas for highly secure data, especially if you're storing uh, tax information, uh, tax returns, anything that would have social security numbers on it or sensitive information. Um, obviously, anything in healthcare, uh, needs to be compliant with protected health information standards of HIPAA. And if you do credit card uh, processing, you should follow the practices for protected consumer information or PCI. You should maintain an asset inventory and know what devices you have. Often people forget that printers and scanners have hard drives on them and that any device that uh, becomes obsolete probably has information on it in some way. Um, and we've already talked about a lot about uh, office security. And I really recommend two-factor authentication whenever available, uh, especially on things like websites, uh, bank accounts, 
uh, any kind of financial accounts and any kind of business systems. Tooth factor author authentication requires the user to not only have a username or a password, which is something they know, but has some other device um, includes one of the following two, either something you are or something you have. So something you have may be a verified device or it could be uh, some other uh, device uh, such as a key fob uh, with a random number generator or a secure uh, grid card. Uh, something you are is a biometric uh, indicator such as a retinal scan, a iris scan, your palm print, your fingerprint, or something else that's unique to you. So in summary, uh, as we manage our risk, we should be looking at awareness and training and answering the question, are we aware and prepared? We should have some uh, asset um, inventory, no, uh, do a basic cybersecurity assessment. If we're not connected to the internet and we live in a vault, then we really have no risk. Uh, but for most of us, we probably are connected to the outside world and we probably do have some physical risk. Have a management plan. Know that you are doing basic cyber hygiene, uh, both with your devices, with your employees, with people that are on your network, and that you're doing uh, preventive measures to lessen your threat of having in that, to having too many vulnerabilities and, and are properly um, inoculated against the threats that come down the road. Have a response plan in case uh, you do have an incident and make sure that you, from time to time, you just check in and make sure you're following your plan. Uh, what's worse than not having a plan is having a plan that you're not following. So some simple questions you should be asking at this point. Uh, what do we do if a laptop or device is lost or stolen? How do we terminate an employee's access when they leave? Is our software and hardware patches up to date? How would we respond if we had a cyber attack? And are all my employees trained to avoid email? So remember, hackers are out there. They're looking for vulnerabilities. They're looking for high worth data. Medical records today are about 100 times more valuable than even credit card data. So that's why healthcare is at a particular risk. Um, they're looking for people that are easy targets uh, and will fall to very simple uh, um, attacks. Uh, or use very simple passwords like password. Um, and um, they will, if there's uh, enough vulnerabilities, uh, they will find one to exploit uh, with their threats. So, what you need to know um, train, be aware. If you run an organization, make sure that you are strong in your messaging, document your policies and procedures, and consider getting outside help. But, you know, be realistic. You only have so much of a budget to put with this, and there's a lot of basic things that you can be doing. And um, what I had listed as a future resource is now available, uh, the uh, guidelines for uh, Practices for uh, healthcare cybersecurity uh, actually came out the first week of January of 2019, and uh, it's available on the internet. Um, we recommend that physician practices and anyone in healthcare uh, download that. It's a very practical guide that will allow you to look at the size of operation you have and do some practical steps uh, to assess yourself. Uh, to educate yourself and to uh, put some things in place. Um, you don't have to be a large organization to do some simple things. So we hope it's been helpful to you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at phil at menmorph.com. And thank you for your attention and feel free to share this with your friends and family.